Here, so vice mayors, please take your seats. I'm just going to log on to Zoom before we start. I completely forgot about logging on. Mayor Jesse Allen. Oh, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> hold. Hold one moment. Our secretary is very eager today. It must be the AG. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, mayors and vice mayors. We're ready to begin. Uh, everyone's online. Uh, Mike, we're good? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it is 10.05 in the morning, and the special meeting is now called to order. Roll call, please. Mayor Jesse Allett. Present. Mayor Del Alvarez. Mayor Jesse, Vice Mayor Jesse Bautista. Present. Vice Mayor Peter Benaventi. Here. Mayor June Bloss. Present. Mayor Anthony Chargloff. Mayor Ernest Chargloff. Mayor John Cruz. Vice Mayor Kevin Delgado. Present. Vice Mayor Christopher Farron. Mayor Jesse Gogui. Mayor Robert Hoffman. Present. Vice Mayor Rudy Uriarty. Present. Vice Mayor Loretto Leones. Mayor Paul McDonald. Yeah. Mayor Rudy Paco. Present. Mayor Bill Kenga. Mayor Johnny Kanata. Mayor Louise Rivera. Present. Mayor Frankie Salas. Present. Mayor Anthony Sanchez. Mayor Melissa Savaras. Mayor Kevin Sisuiko. Mayor Vicente Taitigui. Vice Mayor Albert Tovez. Mayor Alan Nagakta.
Mr. President, we have 18 members present. We have a quorum. Very nice. That's impressive. <laughs> See, it was mossy, everybody. Exactly, especially <laughs> at the beginning. Very good. In compliance. <laughs> Oh, so okay, let's do that. I do want to recognize that the Attorney General is present. Thank you, Attorney General Doug Moylan is here. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Um, I also want to make mention that our Governor's Representative, uh, former Mayor uh, Bob Lizama is also with us, and also Representative from Senator Duane Senecalis is also online with us. So thank you for being with us this morning. In compliance with the open government law, this meeting notice was advertised in the Pacific Daily News on February 8 and 13, 2023, and posted on the Governor of Guam Public Notice Portal. Additionally, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the Mayor's Council of Guam YouTube channel. So we're gonna go right into our guest speakers today. We have three guest speakers, and we purposely added the, the um, AG towards the end of the agenda, so perhaps we might have a little more time with him. And so we'll begin uh, first with Rufina Mendiola from GDOE Chamorro Studies Division. Good morning. Half a day, my Good morning. Is a mommy proposal for a Bengai Gigiman and Mizu Gaigizu Guinina to Matsatsu, my Estrazo, Estamoski, Quarenta Onions. Gaigizu representing is a PC Luhan, if any dock and Senipuk, each more immersion. Kada Sakan, or dispenser, Tibefangogo dispenser, Sean Lohaziti to Mungo for Minut Samoro. Chuntungo for Minut Samoro? Kusau Loko, Haziti to Mungo for Minut Samoro. Pestoro ma damagas como huntungo e finota. Maulek. Pues sin fin para todo hamzo loco e nemangai gigi zoom. Si zus moasi. Pogo na na ogan ma para be sozu hamzo befangogo azudo. Cada sakan des denia molum zoom muna mesha gi mit no bisentus o centa. Cada sakan ma se lelebra e mes tomorrow. Lo ahiti mes e sakan tomorrow. Sakada mes guaha gua guaha gi quatu. Hasu, Miss Senior Jocelyn, lo be. Be introducing us in Mangatsongo. Is again my gospel, see Senor Terrier, because you introduced in my saho. Buenas and saludo, go see Jimmy Santos Terrier. Manuna Songson. Guinea Stumbuzo, lo Sumasagazo Pogo is Chalon Pogo. Okay. Pues is again Ochuna. Introduce in Almus and Buenas, um, Manana Caesars. Gossi Jocelyn Santos, um, Tata Talafofu, Familia Kuz and PT, Los Samas Segezo, Pago Giza Zigo. Press Gohu, nice Rufina Fair and Mingola, Mag Dumonculuzo Giza Hogat, Iba Hogat, Los Samas Segezo, Barigada, this year, Utalike, and on Apizidu Paramingola. Press Bueno, Kada Sakan, Guahama Baba by Celebration, Samor, Guput Samor, at the Ahiti Escuela. Gai gigi huzun gi sengsun. Pes guaha brochure pa ben nayam do Senor Jocelyn is a mommy a CLCS consultant. Pasa huzun. Untungo na guaha 41 na na escuela gi gi todo enteramente gi islang guam 41 na escuela. Pes esti na escuela gi sengsun mizu mege famaguan. Mas gi chanta min na famaguan in in fanon na gi kada dia. Poguna Sakan, Sizus Masi Kogangi in Mahoat Umatak, Senor John Kinata, Gagi Gizum, Senor Hugof Agadesi, Magahi Nakada Sakan, Manhonoham, Mandilikuham, Gikana Isla, Paben Spiego, Mazuos, Nimano, Paben Celebra. Mege, can I make it, can I told you, Mazuos, Giza Islanguan, Gisensung, Esta Matsagi celebration. Poguna Biahi. Como hulu si imahot umata sa lenga polo sa guahu sa dumanya sa ni mababan i i guam heritage no gisa umata gimotsu dia cinco pero sin fin esti na na santa misa para imotsu dia cinco gi alas otsi imedia imismun i a komunidad umata ka esti timatulalay ka i ora lo domingo Zangin mokpu i misa guaha na tautautumano, no? Hintingwa eno. 
Gua <laughs> Sa ezige custom breta no traditional tanagwaha ahi te para isengsunga mas mutso mas ibisita zani famagun pagu na biahi mahot zan bisa mahot mangway zadun na tauto sa hamzu ima gas mami tat kilo question mizu para guaho za ugagago azudun mizu kosinya hamzu gimahot sa guaha wini no na tauto tumanu na na menu Cosina man man lang us hamzu mas yo hafa na putahin ning kanu za empet la papa sa si John i ma hokin a John kinata pa giza i logistic todo i la masa za ni siza komo man mago hamzu man man azuda gi mas yo hafa na fina ning kanu gai gi gilista pa sinya ha u gof agradesi za esti na na ina zudun mizu sempi u gai gi gi a gi gi escuela loki na matungu ni todo i principal i maestra mucho mas i famagun zani manyaina man magu fam na mangagi ham in representanta i famagun zani manyaina pues atan fan esti enagi i logo para kada escuela sempre zangi ni na possible esti guaha zon mami booklet guaha lok bengago go ham zulok ni zon mi logo no zabe na sono gi booklet nos quanto samzu zangin man manazuda hamzu ben asiguru na gaigi zumizu logo gini na booklet sa in gof importante i na zudu na na banda pues ko gwa ha question no okay uh, the mayor that it was recognized na on that's it ruth dispensa zu for na english sa sa tomorrow na pling zu so who has the menu uh, for this um, event, we so have we can to contact you, Miss Jocelyn. Okay, Miss Jocelyn. Pass out the menu for the okay. And then, if you can just coordinate it, maybe with our staff here, okay. and then uh, Miss Joanne, and then we can sign up from there. She just mossy. She just mossy. Is that our mayor from Dedido? We found the napa kaki. We she just mossy. Is that Guamas Christian? The Imahuat Barigada. The mayor of Agania Heights is recognized. Do hafa na humata ka na. Mali ka na question, sinyo. Ko mali ka na question. Lo in may may buhay kada song song po song song, no? Utungo na umbiay magagi ham aganya hide. Insagi asta aganya hide, no? Lo pagu ane ane infafay sin loki question mommy. Espia fa ni mahon mizo ko man interesal para god pita ta ta celebrate buhay na song song. Pues malago sa otro sa kan para ganja ganja heights tutuhan. Who? Oh, esta, esta, benasiguro, esta. Lo lo tungo ata. Lo lo malik yano na question. Hamzu lokin na mangagi ko ni Hudson zangin man interesal hamzu para i i sengsong mito na tutungo ham kontempo. Lo tagi pan na i North lokin. Hunggan, estan sagi di north, di ko esta. Hunggan, ina apa na na balalang siya todo na. Pos dispensa na yung mayor dadero sa tatungo wala ka, muna sa moro. Ah, loginian, gini magasto ko yung loko yung mayor dadero gisdi eskwelang carbilido. Lo, engan sinam pa schedule the be well be. Para ocho sa kan, esta na pagpaki fan. Si Senor Mayor McDonald, esta viva, viva tomorrow. Guam Mas Christian. The Mayor of Barragada is recognized. Si Jesus Masi, si Ipinatun Mizu. Hunga magay golf o golf tungo kimo tomorrow sa kompanya ha sa tinuno mo. Lo maule na matuha na pun check hami todos ni Mio ni sina pun manajuda sa golf maule kasi na programa para sa mga guns at todo do it actually ililimitano right tao na tao tao Guam. Zano, hingga man magu fam na pimpan ajuda, zai sempre, you know, tunga na tempai senjo pagi na nasakan lo penti an manazan todos i aji nai, macam an manazan si agaknya, ami naganya hai senya barigada, that's a sagid no. Esa si jus masih napa pagi mahot, mami barigada si senyor Jim Blas. 
Is that a grandma's question? Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor, put it for board now on his microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did some more hock and put you in Tungo Mositan. Present some more hock, Mayor Pato. Present some more question? Mayor Sabaris? Taza? Taza. Pues, uh, Sempre Lenga in Maho Dedido, see, uh, Mayor Sabaris, Naparata, Nadania, into East Autonia, Guinea, and Pleonia, then in Plea Mami, get a bit short. Zaparo Mali, half and Mustanisita. Pues in fins and in Taza question, a Gehilo, Guinea Estina. Distrito is a guam. Okay, si Senor Alex and Don Cluna, si Jos Martin in Ekungo Camp, Aguna, Naoga, and Hamzun in many Ekungo Tata Guam, Untungo Hansi, Maspo and Maku, Iman Maestra. Iman Maestra, Guaha Huntan, Mommy Gibetness, Bekumbido Han, Malago Matu, third floor, is a Guam Department of Education, and Malago Hamzu, Van Matu, Sabe Songan, Nahungan, Ma Preba Esti, Zamas Mege, Na in a Biba, Para Hamzu. On donc le 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 na saisons massé, la saisons c'est pas bien ici. Saisons massé, comme tu m'as saisons massé. Sempre boule la 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 n'importe quoi par ici, habzone par ici balutan, right? Thank you. Our next guest speaker is Lola from the Triton. Uh, oh, Lola. Everybody knows Lola. Right, Lola? Lola University Guam Press. I, I'm sorry. Come on, please join us. Yes, UOG Press. Did I say that? Did I? <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, again, <laughs> Half a day, so does Hamzu Guahusi Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero, Tao Tao Totsu, half a day, Mayor Paco Lo, Gaius Masaga, he said Zotnia. So, and SDC Pedro Blas. And so, we were to much. So, 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 Giza University of Guam Press. As you know, we were here a few months ago, and uh, we were sharing with you that we were given a, a nice grant um, from the Office of the Governor to promote youth empowerment through cultural literacy. And one of the initiatives was to give you all a wonderful collection of lo local literature, um, historical books, and cultural books that you could use in your village spaces to engage with the youth and um, families of the community. And so this is part of the university's mission um, to really advance regional scholarship, develop cultural literacy, and expand ex accessibility to knowledge about our islands. And so um, I'm not sure if this is going to work. Oh, yes, it is. So I want to first thank all of you for helping us to get this rolling. So we currently, Pedro has been uh, bugging you nonstop for the last few months to get everybody their collections of um, books to be able to uh, roll out the Village Bookshelf Initiative. And so um, I believe everybody except Malesu and Tumuning have their bookshelves set up. And so Pedro is here to arrange for the last to uh, deliveries to Timoning and Malasu. Um, but now is the next phase. What do we do with all these books in the village, right? Um, and I wanted to just really emphasize that the goal of the Village Bookshelf is really in response to the fact that during the pandemic and the shutdown, one of the greatest losses was literacy loss, meaning that um, during that time, our kids weren't engaging in reading as much as if they had been in school. And lots of research really shows that children are more interested in what they're reading if it reflects their lives. And so the press has produced beautiful books that really allow the children to see themselves in the literature that they're reading. And, and we felt that um, books themselves go beyond just the page. And so the Village Bookshelf concept is that these books now all belong to you. We've given you three copies of every one of our publications. We're going to be bringing more. Every time we publish new books, we'll be, we'll be adding to your bookshelf. But 
we want it to not just stay there. We want it to be something that the community can utilize. So um, it's up to you how you manage that. The books are yours. So if you have a borrowing system or you can have people, you can have like a couch or a little reading nook set up for them to read in the space. I know um, your spaces vary. Some of the bookshelves are at the senior center. Some of the bookshelves are at different community spaces, not necessarily in your offices. Um, but wherever the bookshelves are, our intention is for them to really engage the community. And so uh, we wanted to showcase the Barragata Village Bookshelf. Um, so this is um, how they've set up their bookshelf. They've really featured the books and, um, you know, surrounded it with our different symbols of our culture to really embrace this idea of what a village bookshelf can be. Um, and so we, this is one of the, the photos that have been submitted to us. Um, Pedro will talk a little bit more about our contest and, and the need for everyone to kind of submit their photos as you set up your bookshelves. Um, but we also found that a lot of um, like the staff and the mayors, while Pedro was going to deliver the books, were saying that one of the obstacles is having shelves, actually having shelves. So some of the ideas we had was working, if you do know any carpenters in the village, um, to create you know, there's multiple ways that you can imagine a bookshelf. It doesn't have to just be the standard bookshelf. Um, also, multiple spaces where these books can thrive, right, in the community. The best thing is to think about places where you know the community will be or spaces in your village where you'd like more members of the community to come, right? So we, we found some samples uh, online of really interesting ways that people approach this. So I know a lot of people like to dump junk on the mayors, <laughs> but someone's trash can be someone else's bookshelf. So I wanted to showcase this as well because I thought that was really neat. Like even, you know, if you have an old refrigerator, painting it with cultural imagery and messages that you want to surround the books with right was another creative option um, so these were just some examples of what we had found of really interesting ways that other communities have created village books or they don't call it village bookshelves but community bookshelves that uh, people could access and so there was even one where they took an old bus stop and converted the old bus stop into a bookshelf. And so the idea, again, though, is that the bookshelf doesn't become isolated, that it is used to engage the community. And so through our partnership with some of the different community centers and with Menyatlu, we've been going into the villages already doing writing and art workshops with the youth. So what you see here are, um, is a writing and art workshop that we did at the Totu Gardens Community Center and you can see some of the books proudly set up behind the children and um, we had done a create your own character workshop where the children we read a story about Pedro and the golden koku and then you know talked about what a cool character Pedro and the koku were and then had them create their own characters on the left side you see our author Dolores Santos Barcinas and her book 13 months in Malasu and sh you know in the book it features weaving so we engage the children in a weaving workshop. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is we have a really beautiful Chamorro Legends book that's part of your bookshelf. And for those of you that are setting up bookshelves, for example, in the senior centers, this is a great opportunity for intergenerational sharing. So I know that young children don't often visit the senior centers. I know a lot of the senior centers are very centered on bingo, but, um, but also our, our elders, I think it's healthy for them and it's healthy for our kids if there's more sharing. So if they're able to do workshops together if you invite the children to the senior center and we ask some of them and i to read the books that are in tomorrow so they can hear them reading in tomorrow they can read some of the legends and then tell their own versions of the legends or tell the legends of your village right other really creative um ways that nonprofit organizations have been using our books for example we partner with the cps foster children shelter and um, they want to do a community garden based on our books that, um, for example, Senora Rufina, who you just met, she authored the book Imalingu Napatgun, um, which is about a young girl who turns into a flower and their family tends to a garden to honor her. So we are going to be working with the CPS kids. They're reading her book and then now they're working with the Guam, Sustain Guam Sustainable to do their own garden and our CPS kids um, will be tending that garden, all based on that one book, right? So um, we've been bringing the authors to the shelter. 
Um, but we've also been taking the kids out of the shelter. We took them to the tech center to visit the Lati site and to do a sand sculpture contest based on our book, Chup Chup Unai. And so there's lots of ways I think that, you know, we think maybe kids might not like this, but they've been so receptive. When they meet the authors, they are so into the book. They keep asking to meet the artists and the authors. So any of you can host any of our authors. So you can contact Pedro or my coworker, Kiana, if you like certain books in the bookshelf, we can bring the author to you and engage the community that way. Um, you know, other things that we've really been doing that's been effective with the kids as well is for them to share their experiences, right? So, for example, at the Totsu Gardens Community Center, um, we started out with like 10 kids, and when one of the kids ran outside with his worksheet, all the other kids playing in the basketball court ran in, and they wanted to participate too. So I think that we, you know, just in opening up our spaces, the children will come, the families will come. Um, and this is a great way, I think, for us to continue to inspire them to become artists and writers themselves, right, when they see it's possible. Um, so that said, our Village Bookshelf competition is uh, coming to a close. So we will be judging all of your bookshelves um, come the end of next month. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Pedro to kind of let you know what you need to do to participate and how you can win it, right, for your village. Good morning, good day, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Pedro Blas. Um, so yeah, just a reminder that the Village Bookshelf competition will be judged uh, on Mesh tomorrow, next month in March. And um, first prize $500, second prize $300, third prize $150. So as far as criteria goes, and as I said, I have a papa here, and I have delivery to the mayor's office here, no? So I will give you guys more copies today. And, um... Yeah, as far as the criteria goes for the judging, um, so in order to be eligible for these cash prizes, we will be judging on how well the bookshelf is decorated, uh, how well the bookshelf tells the story of the village, and how well it showcases village pride. So that's an encouragement for everyone to kind of own their bookshelves. You know, think of it as a liberation float, a little stationary, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, put your village name on that or something, and you know, uh, it'll go a long way with uh, creativity, right? Uh, we would also like to uh, judge how easy it is for the village residents to borrow or read the books from the shelf, you know. So uh, we know right now a lot of them are just um, staying within the selected areas in which we've uh, dropped them off. But uh, depending on where we set them up at, you know, we like to be able to see how the community engages into the bookshelves and the books. And lastly, uh, how well the mayor's office engages youth and their families with the bookshelves. So just like um, Ms. Lola said about uh, intergenerational sharing, I know I've dropped off books to a few senior centers. So, you know, you can have the seniors come and bring their kids or their grandkids, you know, wh whatever it may be, read them <laughs> stories and, you know, get them to really engage in the books on the bookshelf. So, yeah, again, uh, the judging will take place next month. And if there's any questions of, as far as, like, criteria or... Um, you know, you guys want to send me pictures of how your bookshelf's going or you, you know, want creative ideas. My phone number is at the bottom of the first page. My line is uh, open directly to all the village mayors. You know, I don't really give everyone my personal number. Low. You know, para hamzu, you know, we can do that. So, thank you. Diva, Cesar, Smaasi, I think I have just one more slide. Oh, this one, so. But yeah, so please, you know, we only have a month left. So now that everybody has, almost everybody has their books, um, please don't be shy about reaching out to us. Um, and we can help. We can help come up with ideas. We can help. Like I said, one of the exciting things I think is like our authors are so generous with their time because they love engaging with the kids. So, you know, we can bring them to the space. Um, we have lots of different workshop ideas and resources that we can make available to you. So please, please, please reach out. Um, you know, I really commend Pedro. He was very diligent about following up. And so to those that really worked with him, 
Sizu um, Asmaasi, but Pedro's number is on the contact information, and so is Kiana Brown, our project manager. And so if you look in the criteria, you've got to send us photos of your bookshelf. The other thing is that we're going to be putting out a press release to the media about the contest, kind of building up a lot of interest in it. So the media, those of you that set up your bookshelves right away, we can send the media to kind of feature it, and that way the word gets out in the community. So part of the idea of the contest is to generate community interest so people know that they can come to the space and use the book. So any questions or concerns? Uh, the mayor of Talafofo is recognized. Yeah, John, I think it's next month, right? You know what date? We, we had set it up for earlier in the month, but knowing that we still have two more bookshelves to set out, we were actually going to have it be in the last week of March to give you more time. Okay. And so we'll send, I think on the, the criteria, the date was like March 1st or early in March. Okay, we just kept it open to March, but we are planning to do the judging the last week of March so that everybody has sufficient time. Okay. And we had really wanted it to be part of Mess Chamorro. So okay, that's good. Thank yeah. you. And we'll go ahead and make sure to follow up with the exact date. Any other questions from the members? Anyone online? No? Nope. Okay. Thank you, Lola. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you, too. So in, in, in Lola and, and the group reached the competition point because they wanted to figure out how to get to the mayors and how to get out to the village. So I think the competition is a very good idea that uh, for all of us to, to compete. And of course, you know, may the, may the best man or village win. <laughs> I think Talofovo is going to win because he wants to know what date the judging is going to be. <laughs> Oh, oh, the refrigerator. <laughs> okay. Um, and any, any questions so far before we move on from any members? Thank you. And our last guest speaker uh, is going to be the Attorney General. I have to say that uh, I don't think, since I've been mayor, I don't think we've ever met the Attorney General. And so I'm very happy to know that he made the request to come and see us. So for your edification, he asked, asked to come to see us. And we have many questions for the AG's office. And many times our executive director uh, reaches out to whoever it is that responds to us. And we get the response um, perhaps not in a timely manner. But <laughs> I, we, we, there is a new sheriff in town. So hopefully things will change. And we look forward to that. Uh, and I think the first thing is that he actually is here to, to, to see us and to communicate with us. And so, without further ado, please welcome the Attorney General of Guam, Doug Moylan. Please join us, sir. Thank you. Thank you. and I'd want to first thank the uh, President Alec, uh, Vice President Hoffman, and I would be remiss if I didn't uh, say hello and thank also our, my debtor, Omir, uh, Melissa Savares, <laughs> as well as where our office is located, uh, which is uh, Mayor Rivera. To each and every one of you, I just wanted to uh, be here to, because uh, I was going to actually pay each one of you a courtesy visit for every, uh, I believe there's 19 villages we have in our island, um, because I see that you are the, one of the most important officials for purposes of reaching out to the people that the AG's office serves, which is all of us, but at the same time, each village has a special need that I think that the uh, AG's office is going to try to meet uh, as best we can. Um, and I also want to thank our uh, opioid council member, uh, Angel Sablon, who was with our office yesterday, helping and reaching out to the villages and the, uh, the drug addiction problem that Guam is experiencing. I just had some brief areas that I wanted to share with all you mayors that, um, and then open it kind of up to questions, if that's okay with the president. Uh, Guam is enduring an uh, immigration problem right now. Um, I think when I've been out on the election uh, these past few months, I think it's collectively every mayor is having an issue with the um, immigrants that have been allowed into our island. They seem to um, not really be, yes, I remember going to Mayor um, MTM's, uh, Mayor Pito's uh, village on that, um, which by the way, very well run village. I s there's a lot of uh, military uh, uh, type setup I noticed in your village, Mayor. 
Um, the immigrants are having a problem because they're not following our laws, obviously. But I see that uh, alcohol abuse, and now we've got meth, because it's gone so low on the price, in the court system, we wouldn't see normally a meth case dealing with a non-USA citizen, a local here. Now you're seeing the actual FSM immigrants um, being able to afford meth. And I think that the, the uh, discussion was around you could buy a, either a six-pack of beer or five tokes of meth. And uh, you know the, the effects of meth obviously are much more addictive than alcohol. Um, public intoxication. I'm working with the governor, lieutenant governor, as well as GPD uh, chief to reach out to each of you village mayors that when you see uh, like the, the coalescing of people, whether they're local or immigrants, that you do not want to see at the community centers, bus stops, whatever. You know, the, the old school was you go home at night. You know, if you want to drink, go to your wife and deal with your, your family, drink at home. But on Guam, we're starting to see these people, and I see it in the police reports, and as a defense attorney, I was being appointed to some of them. What we notice is that they're getting together, they're drinking, and then causing trouble. But just the mere fact that they're getting together, drinking at your community centers, baseball fields, whatever, I'm trying to work a, a, a connection with GPD so that they will go to react to your um, concern about these people that are drinking there, and then warn them there's a law against public intoxication and to clear out, go home, or they're going to get arrested, and we will prosecute them at the AG's office because public intoxication is a crime. Now, this, is, of course, is up to you guys if you want to call it in, if you have areas that you're concerned about. You know, um, it's usually when they get disruptive. And also, it's a bad look for the kids. You know, when these guys are hanging out at the bus stations, the kids see that when they're driving by. It's not good for uh, raising our next generation uh, to respect the law. Uh, that goes hand in hand with the loitering. I'm working with the Guam Police Department and the governor, lieutenant governor, to, stop, to start breaking up these uh, panhandlers at the uh, intersections. You know, on the one hand, we're a compassionate island. On the other hand, you kind of wonder if these guys, it's a gimmick that these guys are pulling, uh, basically, uh, you know, taking, asking for money when they really don't need it. But the bottom line from a public safety point of view is it's going to cause an accident, people trying to avoid them, or they're going to get hurt themselves. Plus, it's trespassing because it's on government property. They need to have a properly issued license in order to do stuff like that by DPW, which they won't be able to get because that's not allowed for at the uh, intersections. Um, and then the last one, we all have that car problem, you know, people abandoning their vehicles and stuff. I just spoke with the lieutenant governor. They're trying to work on a program to basically take these vehicles into a, a lot area or contract with somebody. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are auto uh, buffs. Those cars are parts. <laughs> So, you know, there, you actually see it when the cars are left on the side of the road. Everybody starts to pull parts off of it. Um, you know, there's a market for it at, on one hand, but it's also illegal. People can't be abandoning their cars. EPA, of course, will freak out uh, with cars leaking fluids into the, uh, the groundwater. But uh, when I was the AG last, we had a uh, program starting, and I'm, I'm prepared to start it again in cooperation with the Guam Police Department and the Department of Revenue and Tax. When people abandon their cars, there's ways to find out who is the last owner of it. And you don't need the license plate. You guys may know it's the, uh, the engine numbers and the chassis numbers. They're registered. Um, so I, I am uh, prepared to start that program up again. The preference, though, is for the government to take the resources because, you know, the cars have value. You just need to find the proper uh, recycling company like they used to do and then take those vehicles off of Guam. But regardless, the owners of it are still responsible. And obviously, the reason why they dump it is because they don't want to pay the costs uh, associated with getting rid of a car. So um, having said that, I just want to, those are kind of topic areas I wanted to, to uh, uh, talk to you about. Also to let you know that I'm very customer service oriented um, in our office. We may not have and be able to get to you as quickly as we want, but I do have um, a staff that deals specifically with the mayors. Um, Mr. Egna is here today, uh, Harvey Egna, and he has a support staff behind him. Uh, when the mayors have a concern, and I don't care what it is, uh, we also, I'm on the, uh, the website, shoot me an email directly. And obviously, as elected leaders, I have great respect for the positions that you hold. So, um, you know, having said that, I wanted to introduce myself and um, basically be available for you. And thank you for your invitation, or at least allowing me to be here to address you all.
Thank you. I just wanted to ask if you had a conversation with Mayor Hoffman before this, because everything you said, Mayor Hoffman and I had talked about, and so he does actually, uh, he will be first to speak. He, he does have something to continue on that discussion, so thank you. Uh, I do want to acknowledge Harvey. Uh, I was wondering why he was here, but now very happy to know that he's here, because uh, you, we will be a direct connection to, to the AG's office, so thank you, Harvey. Um, please know that they, they will all take a picture of your, they will take your picture and they will look for you. <laughs> Talking about the mayors. <laughs> and so uh, I will recognize the mayor of Sinhanya first, please. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Hafadeh, thank you so much. Full disclosure, I, when I was smaller and much younger, his kids and my, I used to watch his kids there at St. Jude. He was a, he was a devoted St. Jude parishioner there at the time, so thank you. So I, I hope Brandon and Angela are doing well. Yes, and a bishop on Gartner graduate. That's right, that's right. Um, you know, when you were first AG, I wanted, I wanted to thank you because I, I was already in office at the time, and you put out, you know, through, it was through the PDN, you put out a notice and just letting people, informing them what the laws were. I thought that was very, proactive that was good it let people know that hey these are the things that should be done and you know when one of the things we always did is we just made a copy of that and we put it on there and people were like okay this is serious and so you were very adamant at and we actually took I think 20 some to court at the time and the judges then told them just move your car and, yeah. and get it out of there but it was a huge sigh of relief because we were able to track down through your office the owners sometimes it was sold and resold and resold but the original owners like I don't want anything to do with this I'll, I'll remove it myself so and it turned out some of them were tour companies some of them were all this but it I found it to be successful because we had that support of the Attorney General's office then I uh, and it, it did help and I thought by you doing those PSAs your office doing those things and just letting people know you know you sent certified letters to all these people they got it and they came to my office saying what's this about I'm like that's on you <laughs> and so but you know we, we do recognize that there are loopholes in this because it requires EPA land management public works uh, revenue tax so many people to be involved in this crazy process right. and we're trying to figure out tomorrow as we meet the senators to kind of close those loopholes to make it easier so you can actually successfully do something about it versus just everybody you know saying hey let's just all cooperate and be good neighbors so I really appreciate your effort on that and you're right you know whether it be uh, alcohol free zones these are some of the things that we are working on on our side here is how can we do that even without having the legislature but giving the legislature giving us power to declare that for our parks and for our community centers for certain areas where we know there's habitual problems and seeing this so I just really want to echo your sentiments there and thank you and appreciate what you're what you're doing and wish you well in your and we we are here to help you and uh, sh you know let's uh, you know I think that th I think that at the time we sent you this long list and you just went right after you went one after the other yeah. after them so yes, I think you remember that right yeah. yeah and and so and then if you can also help us with the stray dog issue too and yes. just remind people what the lo the leash laws are right. and you know many people are afraid to get caught up in the I don't want to be declared uh, animal cruelty so yeah, I'm letting you know, my dog go I, I have to say that the, <laughs> the uh, that's that balance for those people who treat animals like their family um, and then we see the past few years how the senators have become very aggressive towards and I often use that analogy my dog has more rights than my kid and I think um, yeah. The AG's office has the ability to choose what cases it will charge and not charge. Um, and I will work with the mayors. Uh, I guess the Department of Agriculture with the governor's office is trying to, you know, take the dogs or the, the stray ones because those become, you know, whether they catch rabies or whether they're just violent, uh, hostile dogs, they are a threat to the human beings. And those people that own those animals, they're supposed to be leashed. And if they're not leashed, we're going to be looking at going after the homeowners that have the dogs and choose to open their gates or not keep them leashed so they're causing uh, mayhem throughout the community, let alone our children, five-year-olds. You get a pit bull out there, it'll kill that mm -hmm. little kid because they don't let their jaws go, right? That's the thing with the pit bull. Once it locks, it stays. So, you know, I, I, I strongly believe in property rights, and one of them is the homeowner's obligation to leash their animal. So, and those that are being charged with it, obviously we have the extreme. I think it was on the media. Um, you know, there's a difference between cruelty, animal cruelty, and just making sure that people keep their animals in their own yard, that sort of thing, whether it's cats, dogs, or whatever. Um, it's a property right thing. Thank you, Mayor, Thank for you. mentioning that. That is something that's, I think, coming out in the news again. Um, so we're, we're pro-family, pro-homeowners, 
Uh, but homeowners have a responsibility to keep their animals locked up, That's leashed right. up. That's right. We don't want to punish the ones who are doing it right, getting them vaccinated, registered. And everything. It's right. the ones who let them, you know, sometimes they have more than, you know, I think the laws, they, you're allowed one dog per corner of your house. But, you know, I think that's in there. And most of them have six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen 10, 15 dogs. I'm just like, I don't yeah. think I had one resident had 24 dogs. And yeah. then he had he got sick and we, we actually had to go in and collect all the dogs because he couldn't care for them anymore. Right. So. Right. And that's that whole um, in my office, I'll be putting together certain teams to address these type of issues for the mayors. So you're and by the way, this contacting you are elected official. I'm an elected official. You contact me directly. Um, your staff. Uh, Feel free to contact Harvey and the group that we're going to have over there. But I take uh, your positions you. very seriously. So Thank if you. you have a concern, um, you know, you call me directly. And we have cards here to give to each one of you uh, just Thank to have you. My, my card. Thank you. I, I do appreciate and that. I have to just interject. Uh, since you've been here, I think you mentioned the governor and the lieutenant governor's name more than once. And I have to, it's definitely a sigh of relief. Uh, simply because we are all elected to serve the people of Guam and whether politics aside uh, it is best that we work together to achieve the same goal and so I am appreciative of that as well as I think the rest of my colleagues so that thank you again uh, the mayor of Inalahan is recognized thank you AG first of all for coming I just wanted to kind of talk about the issue with the abandoned vehicle so Interestingly enough, I know you said you want to work with GPD, but quite frankly, in my eyes, I, GPD is part of the problem. And here's the here's the situation: they would pull over a vehicle for whatever you know, uh, expired license plate or whatever the case may be. Uh, interestingly enough, though, if 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 as long as it's safely pulled off to the shoulder of the road, GPD will remove the license plate and just leave it there. And what I'm getting, or what the response I'm getting, is that. They're not, uh, they don't have an impound lot. I heard well, that, yes. Be so but being that, that now becomes the problem of the, the mayor, right? Yeah. So of course, and then of course what we see, as you said, they cannibalize the car, sometimes they burn it, whatever, and ultimately it becomes our problem. So again, uh, while we're saying GPD is gonna be part of the solution, they need to kind of rectify that I, I agree. portion. I think that I, I will talk to the chief about that. And as well as I'm in communication with the, the governor, lieutenant governor, and their, their chiefs of staff, this was raised by Lieutenant Governor um, Josh Tenorio at a meeting we had two weeks ago about that uh, this whole car abandoned car issue, and I, that's when I was uh, told that there's no lot specifically. But I do agree with you. Our our program before wasn't using GPD directly, as uh, Mayor Hoffman pointed out. We actually were using Rev and Tax and sending the the owner of the vehicle a specific notice, and we were going to go after them criminally if that was going to be the case that they don't remove it. And obviously the preference from the AG's office is not to prosecute people. We want to send that deterrent message out. And I think for, for your situation where there, the GPD identifies a vehicle, um, causes that license plate to, to be taken off of it, I think we as the government have an obligation to take that property and impound it. It's got to be impounded, I think. Uh, point well taken. Because that, unlike the other situation where people are just trying to get rid of it, abandon it, um, and take off their license plates so that nobody knows who's the, who owns the vehicle. But, uh, and by the way, for Mayor Hofton's point of view, the, uh, just because you take, you've uh, sold it to somebody under Guam law, until you go to Rev and Tax and uh, change that ownership, uh, you, there's still liability associated with that vehicle. So, uh, yes, thank you, um, Mayor. We are, I'll talk to him about it, and Mr. Uh, Egna is taking notes on these things. Thank you, and I, I do want to say I, we've, we've um, We've had two speakers or two, two mayors talk, and they both talked about the abandoned vehicles, and you mentioned a list. I do want to, to say that we will collectively prepare a list that, uh, of our priorities that we think you could help us with and send that to you. Once that's uh, ratified by this body, we'll send it, and, and we can work on it together. Thank okay? you. Thank you. Uh, the mayor of Dedero is recognized. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moylan, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, like Mayor Alex said, uh, we have never actually uh, met an attorney general in this, in this setting. Um, you talked about uh, the public drunkenness. The, the, uh, so we have signs. Uh, we actually made signs uh, years ago and put both our village logo and DPR's logo to put in our parks that says alcohol-free so, uh, zone areas. Um, when we do call like the park rangers or GPD, they look at us and they say, well, what do you want us to do with them? And so of course, public intoxication is one. 
Um, we also have signs in our government buildings uh, because the police had told us in the past that if we literally say, our signs say no sleeping, no loitering, no camping, they cannot stay overnight. They need to go home. And, uh, but some of them don't have homes to go mm -hmm. to. And that causes another problem, right, in the yes. village. Um, so, and then we have a homeless shelter. But of course, they don't want to register for the homeless shelter yes. because there are rules there. And a lot of it is because they don't want to follow the rules mm -hmm. at the shelters, at any housing program that are available. And then we have mental illness issues. Correct. Mm -hmm. But then issues. in order to put them at behavioral health, the person has to commit themselves. We can't force them there. So those are challenges that mm -hmm. we all have. You know, behavioral yes. health has some facilities within the villages too, because they rent housings, yes. uh, houses in the communities, like group housings. Yes. Uh, however, you know, they have, these individuals have to commit themselves and admit themselves to these programs. We can't force them to it, right? Yes. For, for a mayor of Dededo, uh, Savarez's issues, we're actually working on them right now. We have uh, a communication between the mayor's office, uh, actually, I'm sorry, the governor's office and uh, our office, and we're working on the homeless um, encampments that are starting on Guam. This is a bad look for Guam. Yes. Uh, it's the tourist industry. You know, people don't like seeing that when they, they come to a tropical island to enjoy themselves. But the humanity of it, too, the idea that why are these people, why are these homeless encampments starting on Guam? We've had our investigators start going out and not only photographing them, but going up and talking to them. The, uh, the one that's being known right now is the, the one across, across the mall. Across the mall, the two it. areas. Right. Yeah. And I know that there's some on the beaches, and yes. we're identifying. I think there's, Tengisen is one. Right. They're just, right. There's yeah. about three that we're looking at right now, along with the governor's office, um, because it's going to be a, a, I don't like the word task force or multi-approach, but there's different government agencies that are going to be involved in our approach, and it's within this week that we're starting to look at a possible plan on having them relocated from these sites that they're at into either the government homeless facility, which the, uh, the governor and the lieutenant governor have been indicating that there are some homeless facilities. They raise the issues about meth addiction, um, substance abuse issues, as well as uh, uh, mental health issues. So the proper agency has to take care of them because you can't just throw families uh, with mental health uh, people and stuff like that. So we're getting Guam Behavioral Health involved on it. They're talking about getting a bus over there to invite them to leave. You know, obviously the AG's office could do it the hard way, which is hit them all with uh, trespass complaints or public nuisance. But, you know, that's not our, our attitude that we want to take unless we're forced to take it, okay? So and it's like the, the people panhandling. They get one warning to get out of there. They come back. They're going to be going seeing the judge. Um, on the, the homeless issue, and also I have a, on my agenda to start talking to some of these, uh, you know, the FSM community. The Palau community is better. You know, we all know that Palauans, they don't have as much problems, mainly because of education. You look at their islands, they educate their people, then they migrate. FSM has a high incident that they don't have education to those people that are coming to Guam. That's why we're having, in my opinion, a lot of the problems. They're just more prone to, to be addicted to substances, not being able to get a job, and so forth. But I expect to be talking to the FSM, specifically the FSM community, their, their, um, if they have, uh, what do they call it, one of their associations, because you see it in the, in the FSM, there's usually a woman that's in charge of that household, mm -hmm. and there's many of the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the men that are part of their community and their household. But if we can get the, the women, and that's why I see, you know, I, I've had represented them in, in uh, court and stuff like that. If we can get them to pull their family members together with the understanding that they're going to get deported if they keep it up with their, their criminality and that the mayors don't want to see their, their gatherings after work at our community centers, exposing our kids to, you know, the, the lawlessness that happens, especially after they drink, right? Tomorrow's and everybody else the same thing. But you see it in the newspaper, the skate, skate, uh, skate park incident, stuff like that. There's always alcohol or drugs associated with those type of gatherings. Break them up. And that's why I need, the, I need Steve Ignacio's help. As, and that's, we're going to the governor. And she proactively said that too, that we're, she knows that we're meeting with all the, her cabinet. 
but we're now trying to all get together for the homelessness, the breaking up, getting the officers, because it's not AGs that go out there and, and tell them to, uh, to go home. First, it's you guys. You guys are law enforcement for the mayors. You see it. Then we have to set up a system so that you can call a specific number at GPD so that the Guam Police Department can send somebody in to warn them you're going to you're gonna get arrested if you don't go home. Go home and get those, the FSM community, the women there, to tell their people, their family members and whoever's in their households, you're going to get in trouble, you better get home. Drink at home if you're going to drink. You know, that's the whole idea. Um, so yes, Mary, the, uh, the homelessness issue, the, the uh, gathering, um, what were some of the other issues you mentioned? The, the loitering also. With, the loitering, yeah. is, is, that's all part of it. Yeah. There is a law against loitering. Um, so it would normally be if they're, the homeless has to be uh, taken care of. Right. You know, if they're loitering because they have nowhere else to go, you know, like sleeping in a bus stop or something, uh -huh. we are setting up a network to deal with that. And it's not prosecution. It's right. basically get to public health, um, whatever. And the governor has programs. She's indicated it. Um, but the... The idea also of mental health people, they can be institutionalized. Um, they don't have to voluntarily uh, be brought in. So the, the AG's office has that resource to actually file a case and bring them in and have them, um, it's not incarceration, it's basically institutionalization. So yeah. we, we basically identify them and say that uh, you're going to have to go to a court, a judge, they're going to adjudicate them as uh, yeah. being a ward of the state for a certain time. So even when they encamp themselves in like a private property, just yesterday, yes. Uh, we found out that behind Koshu Lesnar in Derido, they're actually in Tyrone Titano's property. You yes. know, it's all it, what, vegetated. What I would... I, I messaged Ty yesterday, and he didn't even know. What I encourage you mayors to do, find out, because you guys are the best people to know this, who owns that property, because that's the first step. Have them identify themselves to you, and then you get it to me personally. Shoot me an email is my preference, because I've got the team on it already. Because we're looking at that question, like the the um, the one across from the uh, that's the, a the Marcel mall. Camacho's property. Well, from what I heard, it's part like of it the is Guam Ancestral Lands Commission yeah. may be part of that whole, and that's a mess because it's all stuck in probate. So who actually owns it is a big question. But we're at the the point that it's a public nuisance. The AG has the ability to go in there on a private property and basically deem it a, a public nuisance. What we're beginning to find out for the the uh, the mall encampment is like we've heard certain names, the Lujan family, stuff like that. If we get one of those property owners that are entitled to that property to be willing to file One of a, the heirs? Yeah, one of the heirs okay. to file a trespass complaint, because we've already done some of the work. They don't have authorization to be there, at least on the mall property. They were asked, and nobody had any lease agreement or any authorization. So that's easier, because once you find out the trespassing, the police can physically remove them from the property and take them away if they don't move out voluntarily. Now, yeah. again, the, the process we're trying to do is to get some sort of a government cooperation to take them to the homeless shelter. Also, you guys all know this. You see kids in those facilities, yes. those encampments? Yeah. Call CPS. Immediately call CPS because they will be taken away from their parents because you can't have children being in the open environment. Uh, you know, you have no sewage, you have no water. You know, everything that we all know um, so CPS is also being involved in this, but that's that's a very violent way to break up the the, yeah, the, the family. Uh, the unit. family. Yeah. So and it, it's actually a problem for the businesses in the neighborhood right. because they use the facilities. The Micronesian Mall owners have said to us they're having right. problems because they also own American Bakery, right. and you know many of these people actually are from PT or Hoggett or Santa Rita, <laughs> and I called these guys out. I said, you know, these are your residents. They said, keep them. <laughs> Mayor Hoggett told me, tell them to stay home over there, you know, I, but they're, they're there because it's closer for them to panhandle. Yeah. So if we can address them trespassing, yes. and then it'll take care of the panhandling it, it, situation. The, so the, it's a, all the domino the effect. Trespassing yeah. is the fastest way to get them arrested and put into the government, um, the government's uh, criminal justice system, but it's a way to clean them out, clear them out by force of law. Um, again, it's not my preference, but if they don't want to move voluntarily, then there, there's a consequence to it. And we're just trying to, before we move, we want to make sure that the government has some place for them to go. Because again, it's not our, our preference to do that. Having the private property owner is the preference. Um, that's why if you guys can just document it, who's the owner, preferably a lot number and a map would be nice. 
but just identify who's the owner of that. That is the, the trespassing uh, angle. Again, public nuisance. The problem with public nuisance is it may require court action. We're trying to have to stay away from the court actions because it's usually delayed um, type of uh, procedures, but we're preparing for it as well. Um, there was another aspect of what you just uh, said. And this would include Chim those on Chamorro Land Trust that are squatting, yeah. right? Because yeah, the they're not entitled to Chamorro Land right. Trust Right, so properties. we would coordinate with the Chamorro Land Trust Commission because they are the, the uh, custodians of the property. They would file some form of uh, statement that these people are not authorized to be there. We're mainly looking at authorization. Uh, did someone give them the right to be there? And from a mayor's perspective, I, I welcome you to, that's how you should look at it, and I'm sure you guys do. Do you have the right to be there, and under what right do you have? When you guys write it up in terms of your, your case workers or your, your um, crews that go out there, take the photos, write it up, do that, and then send it to us, because it helps us having to spend more time having to, to relearn everything that's going on over there. Um, so th there was another part of that that I was going to say. That was the, the panhandling or the... Um the, the squatting and, and the right, pro well, so we've identified property owners. Um, I've even called because the Dedito Fire Station is the fire station that re responds when they're burning because of the mosquitoes right. at night. But the property is actually into winning, so I've, we went out there. But you know, we bring trash bags. We said you can't be here. Okay. Help us yeah. collect the trash because this is all yours, yeah. and we'll come and haul it out. They, they even bring junk cars. You've seen those. Yeah. They're using the cars. To yes, I heard that. Too. Yeah, they're living so in the cars, and the cars are junking. And right. And then they, in the daytime, they're moving out. Uh, we heard there's maybe about 20, 20 people in the pro in the businesses. They're private businesses also. Okay. So. Also, yeah. I, I would like all you mayors to know, and I've been asking my investigators on this too. If you start talking to those homeless people and finding out they're coming from Hawaii again, or mm. people are giving them plane tickets. Yeah. You need to tell us at the AG's office because we played that game with them before. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we were sending them back to Hawaii with a plane ticket. But well, I mean, that was something that I also did because we were getting people even from the Philippines because they need to fix their social security stuff here. Uh, but they have no place to stay. And so early in the mornings, you know, that flight comes in at 4.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then they get in a taxi and it takes them to the closest mayor's office, which is in Dedido. I went to the taxi stand and I said to the taxi drivers, the airport is in Timuning. To get to the Timuning mayor's office, you make a left at the traffic light, not a right and go down the hill. So, you know, we had to kind of clarify that with them because they're coming off the planes too. Yeah, yeah. That, that's an interesting one I wasn't aware of. But yeah. uh, those people that, are, that we see that don't look like us, that are kind of pulling, uh, you know, pushing the cart or having those backpacks or stuff like that, just, just uh, as mayors, just ask them. You know, where are you from? You know, have you been here for a while? Because, we, again, we've got to be careful about Guam being used as a dumping ground for, because if you watch the news, what's going on in the states, it's pretty uh, scary that their cities are turning into, uh, you know, encampments. Like Oregon, right, 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 and they're close to us. Yeah. So all it takes is a plane ticket, and for them, $1,000 is a discount to get rid of those people. <laughs> um, we try, we're not trying to be <laughs> insensitive, but we have to look at what's, uh, what we're facing in terms of uh, your villages, each of your But they're villages. coming from CNMI, too. We have a group from Rhoda, uh, Mayor, um, Mayor uh, Louisius resident, and, but and they're, they're in the and parks. And you know, uh, th those are our island neighbors up north. Uh, they should be easier to deal with, with calling, calling them, and I, I guess the governor might be able to talk to their governor about incidents like that, but I mean, uh, I'm more concerned about those ones that are, are on that Hawaii plane trip, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, or from the West Coast now. So one of the things, uh, and again, uh, Attorney General, we'll, we will send you a, a scrubbed list of, of the, these things that I think we can, uh, I would like to make it achievable, right, so that yeah. we, we can, we, we take care of a certain number of issues and then move on to another set. But the one thing that we all have are neighborhood watch programs. And so I'm not sure if there are any issues with any of the members and if there's anything that uh, you believe the AG, well, there we go, the mayor of Agana Heights is recognized. The, um, Mr. Moylan, thank you for being here today. And uh, you know, my issues is uh, the violence that's going on in the junior high school and the senior high schools. Practically every day there's an incident, and I think it's underreported. But I hear it from a lot of students in uh, 
that, okay. that come to our office to you know, report it. It's important that you're telling me this now because we have uh, Renita uh, Taimeno uh, Munoz, that's the uh, head of my unit for the family division. Uh -huh. And as you say, a lot of this stuff is quiet. Because it's family court matters with juveniles, it cannot be reported as easily. We had that Bishop on Gartner incident um, that made the news recently. But I, I do want you to tell me because, you know, we, we all went through our high schools on Guam. We knew about the, uh, the issues that, with the fighting and the gang stuff that might occur. Mm -hmm. But now we're, we're worried about the, the meth addiction uh, and the, the price of meth and the dealers trying to get the kids hooked on meth. Um, I started seeing it in the AG's office, and we can't talk about that in terms of particular individuals or families, but I can tell you there's an effort now by the drug dealers to get their next customers from these kids that are, especially the, the teenage kids. That's and right. they're being found with not only just the alcohol and the marijuana, but the actual association with meth addicts. So, and that's one of the efforts why we have the dogs. I, we pushed hard with um, Mayor Sablon yesterday to get funding for GPD. The GPD had no dogs. They had no meth detection dogs. And I've been urging the chiefs over there, take those dogs into the schools and start looking at all those lockers. Because it's usually some kid that's being used as the, the distributor for some adult that's sitting outside the school to get them uh, selling these, these drugs, whether it's marijuana or whatever. We all know that the, uh, the lockers are not a right of privacy. So when they're going up to the backpacks and the, the lockers, um, that is open for um, um, prosecution. Um, but the detection is the main thing. What you're saying too, we're already, I informed our, our uh, unit deputy of family to start charging more of the juvenile delinquents. I am for DOE suspending and throwing these kids out of school. We need to get the parents more involved. In That's the old days, your parents were the ones you fear. That's right. You know? So we're losing that, that fabric of our society. Um, you know, with the Catholic uh, community weakened by what's happened recently, we're seeing less than, you break up the family, uh, the husband, mother, um, mother, father, or kids, the kids just are going to become wards, wards of the state. If you saw what happened last year, late last year, they passed a law that said you can take your children away. I wrote several articles opposing it because I knew exactly where that was coming from. There's a certain amount of time in when a, a child is taken from a family for the family to get their act together. Um, otherwise, the child will become a ward of the state. Military families taking the kids, adopting them, and leaving Guam with them. And the judge breaking the parental rights. There was a certain amount of time that was given for that. Usually, most families can fix it, whether it's you know, alcohol abuse or something like that. When they become meth addicted, those families and the ability for them to fix their, their household is almost impossible. They fail the um, recovery programs. They're in criminal courts. It's just totally getting ripped apart. So we're, we're charging them now. So you find a, you tell me that there's incidents that are going on in the school. I will have the attorneys contact the school and find out if the school is making complaints. Because they have to start it with a complaint that this, in, that this child did something, especially the, the violent fights where they're using weapons and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. that has GPD having to go in there. We will prosecute the children in the family court, which is their minors under 18, but there's certain crimes that they can be charged as adults. Right now, we're starting to look at charging more of the juveniles as adults so that they get their lesson that, you know, this is what they're looking for. And we call it in the, uh, the uh, family court, the attorneys in there, that you graduate. And that's sad when they say that when a minor graduates to uh, adult court because they, right after the family court, they hit 18 and they commit a crime that's going to put them in jail for the rest of their lives. So, Mayor, we're, I'm with you on that. Where you need to contact us, each mayor, tell us, especially the ones with the high schools um, that are having these problems, because uh, I've been told by certain uh, Supreme Court justices they asked, why aren't we charging more of the juvenile delinquency cases? Usually, you see a JD before it as opposed to a JP. JP is when the family has a problem, CPS is getting involved. JD, juvenile delinquency, is what you're talking about. We, I have already instructed um, my unit head to start charging more of those cases. Yeah, and so I, I don't know your policy, but uh, when a minor gets arrested, he gets released in a couple of hours. 
Yeah, right now I know the uh, it's DYA. The, it's the judge um, at the you know the family court judge, but definitely I'll look into that because that's important. If they're being released, has the AG done its job to take that uh, child in and make sure that they're held for a while? I know the judge right now. Um, there's maybe two or three that are handling the juvenile cases. I see that too, where they, they have as long as the parents have them. Now the school will suspend them, right, for the 10-day period or whatever. But and then it goes through a process of you know the, the child would have to admit or deny to the allegations, the petition that we would file in the AG's office. But ladies and gentlemen, the problems that's just usually the tip of the iceberg. When you have kids that are doing that in school, they may be going home to a meth addicted parent, and you guys see that because mm -hmm. you're 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 going you're seeing their homes. So it's it's bigger than just the kids, but I know what you mean. The, the rotten kids that need to have a lesson taught. Keep them at DYA. Um, as a defense attorney in that family court, the kid is he's rotten, but his parents are worse, no, and they I, were the reasons why. I had an, an experience where the where one of the the minors stole the car. We caught him that night. Police took him in. The day after he was released, yeah. and he was laughing at us. No, you no. Know? Th these are the cases where, if like, if you had that name and you want to let us know what case it was, I'll have it followed up on. Okay, I, I guarantee you, those are the cases that I want to find because that <laughs> child is probably going to have a history of doing these things. And by the way, you guys all know that I think in our village in Dededo, uh two weeks ago. A car, an actual car, was stolen by miners. These these miners, and you see it on the videos where they're they're trying to open the doors, and it's kind of funny because a lot of us keep the keys somewhere around the car. They're taking the cars, and they usually uh, are drinking alcohol, um, and then they the car is found in a car accident. That's usually how the kid gets arrested, mm -hmm. is because he rams the car in with his buddies in the back, and they're miners. You know, the ones that are stealing the cars aren't the adults; it's the miners. Whether or not they're working with adults is probably another uh, part of it, but they're usually drinking alcohol. Um, you know, they like to use that ice, you know, that, uh, what is it, uh, iced tea container, and they've got vodka in it. So, you know, this is just part of the problems we're having, but they're minors, they're under 18 that are doing it. A lot of those car thefts are minors. So, give it to us, identify them, and we'll go after it, um, and I'll keep you uh, informed on what, what's going on. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a couple more questions, um, uh, a couple more members. Uh, I'll open it, to, uh, open it up to anyone online. I know there are several mayors online and I have not uh, seen anyone online, but if you do want to say something, please let me know through the, uh, the Zoom room. Uh, the Mayor of MTM is recognized. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Pito. I greatly Mayor Pito. appreciate you bringing up the... Um, Mayor, please pick up your, your microphone. Thank you. I greatly appreciate you bringing up about the immigrants. Okay, I think the problem lies on the screening process at the airport. According to the Compact Impact Agreement, it's education, employment, or medical. Mm -hmm. I, I think if they don't have the proper documents, then they shouldn't be here, even when we travel, sir. They ask us where we're going to stay. They ask us for how long. Is the immigration following up on all these people that are coming into our island? Mayor Pito, you raise a very important point. Paco. Paco. I'm, I'm sorry, um, Mayor Paco, I'm sorry. Uh, you raise a very important point. I just spoke with the governor on that, and she's the one that mentioned that to me, that under the current treaty, that is what is required that before they come to Guam, they have to have a place of employment or proof that they have a job exactly. here waiting. And then also there's a financial... Um, they can't be going to the welfare system like that. So that was just made known to me about a week ago. And what you're saying is can the AG's office communicate probably with uh, Homeland Security to find out how they're, they're uh, vetting it's, it's those people? It, it boils down to the screening process. Okay. Like what I said earlier, when we travel, they ask us where are we going to stay, what hotel, and how long are we going to be there for? Mm -hmm. I have uh, Tom Keeler and uh, Jerome Lorenzo, who's an investigator, but Tom Keeler is the attorney that I've assigned on this whole deportation issue. And I think I'm, I'm going to raise this to him because it's important and the AG's office can contribute to that. 
<coughs> with our relationship with Homeland Security? Because uh, as the governor mentioned, that is uh, important. If, gotta, if we can enforce the screening process, we can mm -hmm. alleviate a lot of these issues that we are having on yes. our island. And um, I'd like to chime in also in uh, Mayor Hoffman's, by law, we're supposed to only have four dogs. And I was not aware of that, uh, and it was kind of interesting. The by four law, corners, four dogs. Yeah, four dogs. So, yeah, for, for you're allowed one for each corner of your house. <laughs> and for the no trespassing, you're supposed to post yeah. a no trespassing sign. If you don't have a no trespassing sign or beware of dogs, there's nothing you can do. Well, I'm going to have my attorneys look at what is the, re what is the uh, relief. Do you guys know if they have more than four dogs? Is there a citation that can be issued? or There, there should be a citation. If, if there is a, and I'll have it checked also, but if there's a citation procedure, it's going to be you issue the citation, then the AG's office will make sure that it's taken before the judge. Because usually those people, you know where they live, so they've got a, they're bound to that property, right? Unless they're renting it, but I mean... If, if there is a procedure to issue a citation, you have my commitment that our office will take it before the judge because I believe that would be the procedure, right? It's like a traffic ticket. It's an infraction, um, but it's an important message to send out. Now, that's dealing with people that actually keep it in their yard, right? But those people that have the dogs, they go out and they defecate in everybody's yards and come back to their yard. You know, that's, the, that's this idea of just grabbing their dogs and taking it over to um, animal control, right? Mm -hmm. And that's Department of Agriculture. Are they? they that's affirmative. That, are they doing that? Yes, they're doing that. In fact, um, the Vice Mayor Barragata and I, we were hunting some dogs yesterday Good. because we have an issue over there by the Harvest bus stop. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. And, um, and then the dog traps. You know, those are very effective. Oh, they're they're smart. They don't want to go in the traps. Are they? Yeah. And back to the nuisance. Okay. I think building Bill One Five Six by uh, Therese Sterlahi was not even passed yet for the nuisance law. Am I right or wrong? Oh, so that was, uh, he is referring to the 36th legislature. So that didn't go through, but we, we're- There's a nuisance uh, uh, we, Yeah, it was a bill 156 in the 36th legislature, uh, exactly. but it's something I think that we're going to revisit in the 37th. Uh, but we, we would wanna work with you on that just so that the, the language is, is correct and that it's beneficial to us. So the issue really is that on our, our end, we can't, if there's a noise a problem, like playing music at 11 o'clock, who, who goes over? GPD won't do it. We can't do it. There's no authority. So uh, that's just one one. Well, one I, I will say example. this, that the, uh, that's why you guys are yeah, law enforcement. Thanks. And remember, yeah. um, what was that, the mayor uh, of uh, PD? <laughs> I was going to ask you about the citation. So before no, I no, forget, no, no. I, attorney, just, attorney Moreland, before I forget, I do want to, in line with, with the citation. So I've gone to court <laughs> without, any, without a, an attorney. And so, of course, we have attorneys that live in the village and judges. And so the thing is, I, I would just coordinate with them or talk to them and then go, out, go into court. So I've lost. Well, the AG, <laughs> yeah. I've lost, I've lost uh, some, some battles yeah. with the judge. And that's because I'm not the attorney, but I try my best to collect as much evidence as possible. Mm -hmm. Pictures, WhatsApp messages don't work. The judge does not like WhatsApp messages. Well, not this judge. So we've had, I had WhatsApp messages. None of that worked. And so I lost that, I did lose one case. You know, so I, I'm committed that if you guys issue citations, we'll either walk you through or have somebody take care of it, okay? Cause that is a biba. You're, you're a law enforcement, you're an entity of the law enforcement. That's what I was saying with uh, the mayor of PD, uh, Ben, <laughs> rest his soul, right? Did he pass? Yes. I think he passed. You know, that, yeah. when I was the AG, that was that incident when he chased down somebody that was, uh, <laughs> he chased down somebody, and then I was called as the AG that he's breaking the law, and I said, what law is he breaking? He chased down this uh, person that was speeding through his village and stopped him, and he says, they're authorized to do that. You know, you, you guys, and I'm, I'm, I think they removed the authorization or something uh, in the statute, mm -hmm. um, and I disagreed with it. Because that your ability, you guys understand yourselves as law enforcement. Correct. If somebody's speeding in your village uh, you have certain authority Correct. to take action, I understand, under the statute. Correct. So you're, you're like police officers, um, but localized to your village. So you've got my commitment as an attorney general to support you in court 
um, pursuant to the statute. I had to recheck that because Ben, they tried to arrest him, and I told him you're not arresting him. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you guys are law enforcement. You're you're the front line, literally the front line, along with the police department. But um, Mayor Paco, I will work to uh, you call me on on issues like that. So we'll work it out. Um, I'm humbly asking know. you to work on the screening process, and yeah. we'll alleviate all these issues that we are encountering here on yeah. our island. That's a very big one, and I agree with you. We, we stop them from poor coming in. We use less resources, have less crime victims than um, having to deal with now. Have you ever watched that show, How to Catch a Smuggler? you got to watch that. Very <laughs> intriguing. <laughs> I will. Thank you, Mayor Paco. Um, and uh, the executive director is now recognized. Hi, hi good morning, uh, AG. Uh, it's payback time. You kept us for a long meeting yesterday, so we're keeping you for a long <laughs> I meeting. I apologize, <laughs> but we got money out. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, mine are just baby, um, questions are this open government law. Now, of course, every mayor here is affected by this because they have municipal planning councils and they have meetings. And many of them don't have the funds to do this. So we've looked at the statute, actually we've asked the former AG for an opinion on uh, what entails this publication. Media, printed media, radio or TV. Now radio or TV is cheaper, but the question comes is, how many times do we do it on radio? Is it one time and it suffices for the whole five-day notice? Uh, is it the morning drive, the afternoon drive, or the evening drive? Um, what if just the mayor calls up and, and one of the hosts says, oh, I'll give you time to announce your meeting, and you announce the meeting, and you uh, read the agenda. Does that suffice for uh, announcing it? Uh, because it doesn't say on the law how many times or how you do it on radio or um, TV. Print is, well, we know what it is, yeah. but then we're trying to find ways to be able to save money. We're not yeah. going to do away with, we're, yeah. we're complying with the law, it's just that we're trying to figure out a way how to best make use of the funds that, that they do have. So maybe your office can look into that and find yes, out. Yes, we yeah. will, and I've been getting some requests for some guidance on that, um, and I do agree with you. Uh, Obviously, the five was a five working days, five days before working days, maybe, and then the um, 48 hour. But that's usually publications easier to see. But if you do it on the radio, my, my recollection was that you just have to have proof that it was done, like the, the receipt and then a confirmation from the radio station that they actually did it. But uh, I will check that for you. Send me that message, and I'll probably send it to everybody because there has been requests at the AG's office for better guidance on uh, the open government law and notices. And I know that they're leaning towards having one website for all GovGuam notices um, because they're always getting into fights about whether it's a proper notice or not. And the consequence, it's a misdemeanor, plus it's a cancellation of that meeting, uh, whatever was conducted on terms And everything of is void. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I'll have it checked. Okay. I'll double check on that. And, and the other question is, marijuana is legal? Is it not? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, marijuana is legal under Guam law, but under federal law, it's still a crime. They're not enforcing it right now, but that doesn't mean that they can't tomorrow either. And the reason I ask is because every applicant for Gov Guam has to undergo a drug test. Mm -hmm. And They're so when it positive. comes back positive mm -hmm. for marijuana, yeah. and they tell us you can't hire this person, so what, what rights does the person that is positive for marijuana have to go against the government and say, hey, it's legal? Well, what I'm hearing is that the, the, these uh, federal programs, that's where they're getting in trouble because they're testing positive for marijuana and they can't be approved because that's still a prohibited uh, substance in the federal system. The local system, I've never heard that that was being done, but I'm not sure either. So, but as an AG, because I take, quite frankly, all of you guys, you should realize the, the oath that you take, you know, read it. Yeah, it, it says you, you have to uh, comply with federal law. Um, and that's in our Organic Act and part of the uh, requirements. But getting that to the side, as an AG, we're not touching it. And I, I've, uh, unfortunately, I love Daphne up at DRT, but we're not touching it because we could lose our license under the federal court. Um, but, but still, over at DOA, they tell us we can't hire the, I mean, the poor guy only wants to come and do maintenance in the village, yeah. and because he tested positive for marijuana, 
We can't hire him. Can he stop taking marijuana and reapply? Six months later. Yeah, he, he might. You might. That might be the best advice for him. Go to treatment. The the way it works is they go to treatment. No, if they fail their test, they go to uh, dr the uh, drug and addiction treatment. They get a certificate, then they can retake the test. Okay. They re then they reapply. That's the government policy. So they have so to. That's the DOA but policy. Yeah, but after three times, if they keep failing, then that's it. Yeah. So they they can't hire them. See, the danger is also they're putting it in the substance. They're allowing the foodstuffs, so you could actually have something that you're eating that's mm -hmm. marijuana and unknowingly uh, become, you know, positive. So it's, on it's it. actually just a, a policy that we have to comply yeah, with. Yeah. Well, it's DOA has its policies, right. so I would say do the workaround. Tell the person if he really wants his job, then he's got to make sure. He, <laughs> like, uh, I think that's probably the procedure. You 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 got to go through that little program and stop doing it. And then I mentioned this to you yesterday about drug houses. Yeah. I know you mentioned okay. Okay, that was something villages. that I was also going to yeah. mention. Mayors, you guys know where the drug houses are. Send them to me, email me on it, and we're going to because we do have an effort. We're looking at it. There are public nuisances. The you know it in the states, they, they go after them. We, the drug enforcement people, they probably know exactly the houses you're talking about too, mm -hmm. but from the AG's office, we can work with the law enforcement, especially some of these big ones that people know about, you know, the open and notorious ones, because I even know in Dededo, they did, uh, um, around the, uh, the transfer station, I know they actually hit that house with the, the search warrants and they, they got those people, so, yeah, just give us the information, give me the information, and I'll get it to the, the right people so it'll be tagged as a, a possible. Because the, the uh, drug enforcement people, they know, they, oftentimes they know who it is. It's not the house that it is, they just know the person is living there. Yeah. So that's how they know that house, and they may be observing it for certain purposes. And but our yes. last one will be the uh, mayor of Inalan is right now recognized. Yeah, not a question, or it's just a comment. I just wanted to follow up with angels uh, regarding the open government law. So, you know, the, one of the things that really irks me about that, number one, is an unfunded mandate uh, imposed on the mayors. That's one. Number two, the question now becomes is like, why would I from Inalahan want to announce island-wide our Inalahan issues? Mm -hmm. And so it, to me, it doesn't make any sense at all for us to go and, you know, throughout the entire island, let everybody know what I'm going to talk about in my village. And likewise, you know, I'm sure Mayor June's probably not all that concerned what's happening in mine. Likewise, I'm not so concerned what she's doing. But it's a it's a mandate that's been imposed on us, and and like Angel said, we the funding that's tied to that is hurting our budget. So it's been a question like whether or not can we go on the radio, can we go, do other avenues, mm -hmm. do other means? Like can we just post it on Facebook and see if that's uh, you sufficient? Know, this this is the discussion with the new legislature that's out now. I I know everybody's you know this has gone for over a decade, right? Senator Brown is a senator again. I I believe her and Senator Liz Anderson were very they're advocates of that. The fact that you need to tell people what you're doing, right? We all agree that that's important. The public discourse in it, this is taxpayer money. But the, the funding is causing all the problems on how much it takes to get to that point. And then if, if it's not done properly, then you've got to redo it, and then there's more money involved, and the requirement for the detailed agenda. That's why there's talk now about just doing a website so that everybody knows if you want to know about the meeting, just use your, your cell phone to find out what's going on. So I'm, I'm, I'm one of the advocates of that. We need to make it so that it's simpler and easier and that there's a compliance without all these technical problems that are occurring. So I, I will work with the senators on it. Um, I, I, I get it. I know where you're coming from. So thank you, Mayor. Attorney Monet, I want to just add on to the open government discussion as far as the recording and the live streaming of the meeting. Mm -hmm. So that, that for me, uh, that's the most difficult part because the yeah, live streaming yeah. is we it's a good thing it's free on YouTube otherwise we couldn't really afford it and zoom I pay for it out of pocket and so if I'm no longer president who who's going to pay for it who resumes that right responsibility right and so uh, we can't issue a purchase order for zoom or not that I'm aware of I mean but Again, it's because it's the cheapest way right. to go. So uh, that, that in line with open government law, I think, is something that we really would like to revisit. And we want to be transparent. And if we can do Facebook Live, again, Facebook is free, right? But it's Facebook a qualified uh, yeah. avenue, uh, right. right? And S senator or, uh, mayors, the senators are really, if, if you guys, you have your relationships with all the senators, they are the fastest and easiest sure. ones. Because I would just be a, 
yeah. the, the legal perspective on it. Again, it I was agree. just, it's just, I think, a core helping us to also figure out w how to comply with the law yeah. without breaking it, right? Right. Uh, so that's that. And the last thing that I do want to recommend or that I want to suggest uh, council-wide is the uh, procurement law, right? And so uh, in for us, we're, each office is required to submit six quotations for their their requisition in order to for a purchase order to get released. Okay. Um, of course, I keep on reading Public Law 36-103, and it still says three quotes. But our certifying officer won't let it pass with three quotes. Uh, the clarification for that I think is important, and I think it needs to be in black and white. And and I don't blame the certifying officer for not taking it. No. If I was that that's a big part of, of what we're at the AG's office. Certifying officers are paid a certain amount of money. And when we started indicting people before, it was the certifying officers that were getting it because mm -hmm. they're being paid for that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but that, yeah. that's how we, we no. go after yeah. people. But, but uh, <laughs> that's why I have my certifying officer make sure they sign clearly. <laughs> right. so, so, no, no, uh, please have your staff send me the request for right. opinion okay. on that public law 36103. 36103, 36 right. yes. So okay. I, I think we can resolve that, that question. Well, after all is said and done, I do want again, a, a, extend our appreciation for your uh, interest in our work because I think at the end of the day it is the work of the people and that's all we really do here well it's not all that's a lot of work and um, I do appreciate the the communication with us as mayors uh, we work we try our best to work with the administration I think we've done a, a very good job uh, crossing political lines doing that uh, I'm hopeful that our work with the 37th Guam legislature will be the same uh, as it is with you and with the governor and lieutenant governor. So uh, again, thank you. Thank Just, you. I thank don't know you. how else to say it, but thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. You guys all have a good day. Yeah. We're going to move on to announcements. Uh, so do, don't forget, if you RSVP'd for the breakfast, please make sure that uh, you uh, you it's 7:30 tomorrow. Uh, if you have any issues, please make sure you call Mayor Louise because if you did not RSVP for the breakfast, uh, Louise, Mayor Louise did not get it and we did not get you in the count. Uh, if, if you did not RSVP and you still want to make it to the breakfast, please make sure that Mayor Louise is uh, informed today. Uh, I do want to announce that Inalahan is having their Godel Festival. Uh, if I, I'm sorry that I may not have said it correctly, but it is this weekend. I will not be able to attend. So please, if you are here and available, please uh, check it out this uh, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Are there any other announcements? Yes. Oh, the, the state funeral for former mayor and former senator uh, Peter Trelai is Friday as well. And so uh, if you receive the um, if you receive the invitation, please make sure that you are SVP. Okay, any other announcements? Oh, hold on, hold on. Okay, two two big funerals tomorrow. Or Friday, I apologize. Yeah, Senator, probably Senator. We, of course, it's always the president is the, the last office. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other announcements? If there are no other, wait, let me just verify. Are the mayor of Dedito is recognized? Okay, thank you. If there are no other announcements, it is 11.35 in the morning, and this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much.